Okay, I think we're ready to make a start. Um, anyone else can join us? Um, ah, rushing in at the last minute. Um, so, thank you for coming to my talk today. I'm going to be talking about application level debugging and profiling, but more particularly, gaps in the tool ecosystem. So what do I mean by application level tracing or debugging? Um, essentially, we have um, a multitude of instruction level or code level debugging tools, um, and we have a multitude of system level monitoring, uh, monitoring tools that monitor physical resources, such as the network um, and the file system. But what I'm going to talk about is marrying the two, um, so looking at applications as multi-program um, entities, potentially multi-machine entities. And who am I? I think it's always um, helpful to know when you're in a talk who on earth is speaking. Um, my background actually is in semiconductor architecture. Um, so my uh, career started out as a digital designer doing embedded software and uh, digital design. Um, but what I found myself doing is spending most of my time installing the CAD tools, um, debugging um, embedded builds, reading other people's scripts. And so um, I left that area and founded Alexis. Um, Alexis is a company that specializes in tracing Linux applications and profiling file IO in order to solve installation problems, build problems, dependency issues, and so on. Um, the main thing is we work out why your application doesn't work where it should, i.e. works fine um, in, in your environment. As soon as you deploy it somewhere else, something goes wrong. Um, and we try and take the guesswork out of working out why it's gone wrong. And what am I going to talk about? Um, I'm going to talk about profiling and debugging technologies. Um, so I'm going to mention a few tools, but I'm going to focus more on the technology underpinning them. Um, I'm going to include a bit about our tools and how they work as well. Um, and I'm going to talk about gaps in the tool ecosystem. So what is missing? What do we need? Um, and hopefully by the end, um, we'll have uh, a bit of an idea about uh, where we need to go in the future. So this is what our tool looks like. Uh, we pull out tool hierarchies, um, uh, program call hierarchies. Uh, what you're seeing there is actually a trace of Firefox. Um, the root node is always shown in green. We show scripts in blue and programs in orange. So what you're seeing there is that Firefox is actually an alias for a script. It calls two other scripts and a bunch of programs in the system. Uh, it then finally calls the Firefox binary itself, which makes a bunch of network connections shown in purple. Um, so this was originally designed to um, help solve problems with scripted flows, um, particularly in the semiconductor industry, but, but really anywhere where you find yourself reading scripts and executing in them, them in your head to find out what's going on. Um, but it's been extended over the years to uh, look at more system-level problems such as library dependency issues um, and so on. And this uh, graph really illustrates what I mean by application-level tracing. So we're not looking at debugging any process in particular. We don't look at the algorithmic details. There are many, many debuggers that can... Um, help you solve algorithmic problems um, out there. It's more about when we pull the whole application together, whether that's the installation process, the startup procedure, and all the, all the tools um, around it. Um, that's, what, that's what I mean by application level debugging. So uh, the way Breeze is normally used is in um, comparing two applications. So you would make a trace of 
a tool on uh, a system that works, a trace of, of, a, of a tool or, um, or a scripted flow on a system that doesn't work, and you get to compare the two. So that could be working out what's different about a particular machine, um, what's different about a particular user. I mean, it's, it's so common that uh, you put together a scripted flow, hand it to someone else, and, and it doesn't work. And you need to work out why it doesn't work, whether that's a missing dependency or whether they're just using it in a different way. Are the arguments they're passing in um, the same? Do they have some um, user settings that interfere with the problem? Um, there are lots of tools out there that can help you make sure that your Linux installation is the same every time, same, uh, same packages installed, same libraries and so on, but nothing can really prepare you for um, changes such as um, a user misspelling an environment variable. So um, we help you take the, the guesswork out of working out what's wrong um, by looking at the application instead of looking at individual programs or just the system. And in 2012, we also added file I.O. profiling um, for remote file systems. Um, so that means that you can not just work out what your dependencies are, but you can also work out how often different areas of the file system are being accessed. Um, this graph here is a, a build with multiple targets, and you can see um, each uh, orange spike is accessing an area of the home directory, uh, each uh, green line is accessing areas of slash temp, so you can very, very clearly see the build cycles for each, each target in the system. So in this way, you get a very holistic overview of what's going on. Um, I mean, I've mostly tracked slash temp and slash home in this graph, but you could set up um, Breeze to look at your uh, database um, installation, your uh, tool installation, and... Um, and track what it's doing in those ways. And this really highlights where we are going as a company and where we see the industry going, in that increasingly we're being asked to match up physical resource use with application status. Um, that's a theme that we see time and time again, and that's really what this, this talk is about. It's about making sure that if your file system is being... Um, overutilized, if you're seeing spikes in the network, then trying to get back and work out which application is actually um, causing that, that particular behavior. Um, it could be something as simple as um, a global pattern match matcher in a script can actually cause applications to trawl the entire file system looking for, for matches to that, um, to that regular expression. Um, and it's one of those things, it's very, very easy to do, it's very, very difficult to actually look at the performance of your file system and work your way back to which script, which line of which script is actually causing that to happen. So I've talked a bit about our tool, Breeze, um, but I want to talk about what else is available um, and how does it work. So uh, we've had instruction level debuggers for years. Um, some of them are really excellent. Uh, many of you will be familiar with GDB. Um, GDB is actually uh, quite funky in that when you set a breakpoint, um, it actually swaps in a special breakpoint instruction into, um, into the code so that when, in hardware, when you hit that breakpoint instruction, everything halts um, and GDB is alerted and you can, you can take it from there. So that's an example of um, hardware and software um, co-design. Um, the, the software wouldn't work without the hardware support, um, and, but for that reason, uh, it works very well indeed. You get very, very good performance. Um, but it's still not really any good if you're trying to work out what's going on at the system level. Once you've got it working and sent it to your customer, um, 
if it suddenly slows down at one particular point, GDB is not really going to help you. You can't really go into the customer site and, and debug it on site. You probably don't have any debug symbols in there anyway. Um, uh, Valgrind is another tool which um, is extremely powerful for, for doing instruction level debugging. Um, for those, those of you who don't know, Valgrind is a tool, um, although I'm reliably called it's, uh, re reliably informed it's uh, pronounced Valgrind actually. Um, uh, it's a tool for spotting memory leaks in your application. Uh, so in, in C, that's as simple as making sure that you've uh, got a free for every malloc, but it can do a lot more, a lot more powerful things than that. And that Valgrind, Valgrind actually works by rewriting your binary and rewriting the allocation and free statements so that they can actually track all your memory use throughout the application. It's, it's, it's a really phenomenal tool. Uh, give it a go if you've never, if you've never used it before. Uh, but again, it's, it's more at the application development stage when you're um, up to your elbows in, in code. It's not really about um, working out what goes wrong once you've actually got your application running in the, in the wild. Um, so the, there are various challenges as with any tools as well. It's not only is it difficult to, to deploy this in the field, but um, it can be difficult to make sure that the debugger doesn't change the application as well. Um, I'm sure most of you have been trying to debug a race condition which disappears as soon as you attach a debugger to it. Any kind of change, even with the, with the uh, most minimal overhead, um, can potentially cause a problem. Um, and I've just talked about some, some very old, well-loved um, instruction level debuggers, but there are a few new ones on the market. Um, I'm not going to list them all, but just a couple here. Uh, for example, undo software takes snapshots uh, through the running of your application, so you can in fact run it backwards. Um, no, you no longer have to sort of hit a breakpoint and um, uh, and try and guess what scenario led up to the state. You can actually use their tool to to step back in your C or C++ debugger. Um, similarly, a linear um, can uh, debug parallel code across multiple machines. So if you have um, an embarrassingly parallel problem with um, many, many processes running your algorithms, uh, then you can optimize your functions using, using their tools. So the, the tools available have really come on. They're innovating all the time in this industry, um, and there are, there are dozens out there to choose from. But it's still, it's still not about debugging the system. It's still not going to tell you why your database is a bottleneck one, um, or, or why your, your network that you so carefully, carefully planned out isn't, isn't up to scratch. Um, a lot of these tools focus on embedded, but these days when my phone is about as powerful as the computer I took to university, um, what, what does embedded mean anyway? So uh, many of you will also be familiar with a tool called Ptrace. Uh, Ptrace is uh, built into the Linux kernel um, and gives you access to, to system, system level, library level calls as the application is running. Um, Ltrace and Strace are both built using, using the Ptrace API and they, they show system calls and library calls respectively. So here I just want to have a small pause and clarify exactly what I mean by system call and library call. Um, the, the terms are often, often used interchangeably with good reason because a lot of the library calls have the same name as the system calls and map directly, but many of them don't. When your application runs, irrespective of what it is, there's a very good chance it links into the glibc library in order to access the Linux kernel. So that will be for everything from opening a file to connecting to a network to spawning a, a child process. Everything has to go um, to, to a, into, a, a, into the kernel via system call. 
and most of the time that's made easier for you um, using the glibc. It's um, much easier to call um, some of the some of the high level constructs rather than work out um, some of the low level uh, mechanics of of the I/O. But they're still in there for for you if you want to want to use them. And Ltrace. Uh, gives you library calls, strace, unsurprisingly, gives you system calls. Both these tools dump out a huge amount of information. They're often used to solve system level, application level problems, but it's it's really like sipping from a from a fire hydrant when you when you try and um, sort out what's going on with these applications. And they don't cope very well with very very large applications. So it's very very quickly you end up with gigabytes and gigabytes of data, trying to sort through and find out which process you want to look at and uh, which call is interesting can be very time consuming. So now I'm going to talk about another technique, um, Breeze, our tool and others like it use LD preload instead of ptrace. Um, this is just for a show of hands, um, how many of you are familiar with LD preload techniques? Excellent, excellent. So LD preload is a technique that allows you to override library calls. It's most commonly used to override um, a glibc or to um, replace a, a system library, um, but you can actually preload any, any library you want and override any, any library in the tool. So if, they, if your application has got proprietary application specific libraries you can even override those if you know the if you know the um, function signatures and the way it works it's very simple you set the ld preload environment variable that's why it's always in capitals it's not that we are so excited about it we need to shout um, the then once the the uh, linker sees sees your library in the environment it will actually preload that ahead of any other system libraries that your application is linked against. And by preload, I mean exactly that. I mean any calls that the application makes go to the LD preloaded library before going on to any other system library. And it's really up to you whether you, in fact, call into the glibc library um, or return something else. Uh, so this, is, this provides a very, very powerful interface um, and it allows you to manipulate the application. So unlike using ptrace or strace, it doesn't just give you data, it allows you to handle all kinds of scenarios that uh, strace won't, won't cope with because uh, you can't inherently change the application. So this is what um, a preload library signature might look like, uh, you simply match the, the function signature. Um, so here I'm overriding the read function in glibc. And the first two lines might look a little bit like jiggery pokery, but all we're doing in the first line is defining a function pointer and using this special function uh, dlsim to get the next read function in the, in the chain. So in my illustration here, uh, we only have um, uh, the Breeze preload, preload library and the glibc. But you can chain together pretty much as many, as many applications as you like. I'm not aware um, that there's any limit, but I'm sure, I'm sure some of you could find it. <laughs> um, so all you do is ask for the next read function. Um, do whatever it is you want to do in your wrapper. So here we're just printing information that this application has read. Um, and then finally we return, uh, we call next read, um, which would be the real read function, as it were. So here we're not changing the behavior of the application materially. We're just adding a, a print statement. So similar techniques can actually um, do more powerful things, such as swap file systems or suspend and resume a job. So here we have um, another, uh, another library wrapper. 
Um, in, this time I'm wrapping the open call and what I'm doing is uh, replacing, uh, prefixing all the path names with a slash alt, meaning alternate file system. So in that way, whenever your application tries to um, access a file in the home directory, it will instead be diverted to a file in slash alt uh, slash home, for example. Um, so this is not totally unobservable from the point of view of the application because if it reads slash proc to find out if it's opened the right file, it will find it's, it's actually opened something else. But not many applications actually do this. Uh, so most of the time you can very, very safely just swap um, one file for another and the application will continue to run provided it sees the data that it's expecting. So here we just return next open with the alternate um, path name and so we can, you can use this to, to hot swap a different file system in, in at runtime. And uh, many of you may be familiar with the Yocto project. Uh, the Yocto project actually uses a tool called sudo um, in order to do just this. So in this call graph, you can see that um, in the, in the Octo build, they use a build system called BitBake, uh, which then makes a call to sudo, which is just a wrapper strip that sets the LD preload library. So this is used to fake root access. Um, the, during the build, the application thinks it has root access to the file system. In fact, um, the file system is swapped out for a database. So here you can see that um, whenever, the, uh, whenever the application tries to access a file, it, that open or read write call is in fact redirected to the database and the data it's expecting is returned. So that means that you can actually do a Yocto build without being root. And now this all sounds, sounds very simple. I've touched on a few things that can go wrong, um, but in fact, it's a minefield of things that can go wrong. Um, newer applications actually are much easier to trace than older applications, but we have a legacy of older applications. So I don't think there are very many applications that don't use, for example, bash or make um, uh, in order to... In order to indeed start, um, and you have to make sure you get absolutely everything right. So, for example, if you're trying to run Breeze and sudo at the same time, Breeze needs to be first, but sudo needs to not know that it's not first. And you also, I've talked about just overriding one function in the glibc. In fact, the glibc has got multiple versions of each function. You need to get the right one. It's no good if you start returning the wrong value the API is mostly clean, but some of the data structures returned have changed over the years, so if you get the wrong one, it's a complete disaster. So from, from that point of view, it can be very difficult to get right. So it seems like a, a sort of a silver bullet solution, but in fact, you need to be just as careful as with anything else. So why should you care about application tracing? Well, system design is getting more and more complicated. We heard in the keynote um, today all about cloud. Um, I'm sure if, if anyone doesn't know what that is, then I suggest you're lost. Um, it used to be that we had uh, a single application um, running on a single operating system on a machine that had local storage, but that's not the case anymore. Now we have the application and the operating system sitting on top of job scheduling, virtualization, on top of a host operating system, as well as a whole bunch of other things in the stack designed to give you more options and abstract away from the complexity. But at the same time, it breaks us further and further apart from the real system resources and the application. So if everything goes right, it's amazing. When something goes wrong, it it just makes it so much harder to work out what the problem is. 
we now have multiple applications running on the same machine that have to be um, separate from each other. They may share, they may have their own core, um, but they're still ultimately running on the same chip and have to have to share I/O resources, for example. Even if you've abstracted your applications so that they run on separate machines, they may share a network connection to a shared file system. So it's very, very difficult to keep everything separate and keep this um, abstract bubble of virtualization running. Um, in an ideal world, we would also have homogeneous hardware so that it doesn't matter where you deploy your application, you get the same performance every time. But realistically, that's not cost effective. Most companies will buy a bunch of machines and then upgrade at some point by buying some more machines. Those machines will not necessarily have the same uh, applications stored on them. They won't necessarily have the same performance. And at that point, we start to see performance bugs such as um, race conditions appear on some machines but not others. Um, and I just want to put it down in the bottom corner because actually this is a company mainly working with Windows and Mac at the moment, but this gives you an impression of just how complicated it's going to get. Um, Bromium is a company that's working on creating a virtual machine for every single process in your in, on your computer. So, for example, if you're editing multiple Word documents or browsing multiple tabs, each one of those run in their own operating system stack. Um, so, from a user point of view, this is amazing. You can click on absolutely anything and you know that you can't infect your computer with a virus because it's, that tab is trapped inside the operating system um, in, for just that just that tab. You also, um, because you're customizing the operating system stack, you can actually avoid many of the, many of the problems that arise from having a very predictable stack. It becomes it very, very difficult to write viruses as well. So I just wanted to talk to, them, talk to you about them today, not because this is a technology that is um, coming to Linux immediately, but because it's the kind of thing we can expect in the future. Basically, um, we're just going to have the most unbelievable amount of complexity in the software stack, and everything is going to get harder. So now I've got a couple of case studies to show you what can go wrong when you have um, too much abstraction. Um, so we did some work with ARM recently um, on profiling their file system. Now they have a huge cluster for compiling their chips. They run a lot of verification. Uh, computationally, it looks a lot like mapping the genome or, or uh, doing uh, financial trading. It's lots and lots and lots of, of operations done over and over again in order to verify their system. And performance is key. The... Uh, they have a complex file system hierarchy in order to make sure that all their needs are served, some super backed up, some super low latency, and it's critical that users or that their developers use the right area of the file system. So their applications um, are largely speaking uh, third party. Um, CAD tools that have been bought in in order to do the verification, and then they put their own scripted flow around that, like, like many others in that industry and, and others. So that means they introduce a whole new levels of application dependencies that are designed by some local engineer and not necessarily controlled by a third-party tool. Um, they have license settings, so the license server is also critical because if you're running lots of short jobs, High license latency can be a bit of a disaster, but I'll come back to that again. Um, but their main question was, is everything being stored in the right place? And unsurprisingly, the answer was no, it is not always being stored in the right place. So this is actually some results. I hope you can all see that. It's come out quite well on your screen. It looks terrible on my screen. Um, the, this is actually the first job that we traced 
um, with them. Uh, we looked at two areas of the file system slash temp where you hope there is loads and loads of activity because you want to be doing all your temporary calculations on local storage. You don't want to be hammering the network and sending, sending data back and forth unnecessarily. Um, Scratch was a area of the file system used for results. Um, so fairly low latency, it's just designed literally to spit out, for the application to spit out a log file and it hangs around for some time. Um, but you can see from this trace, uh, we looked at the number of writes to different areas of the file system. You can see that slash temp is hardly used at all, whereas scratch is, is used quite heavily. So in that sense, they were, they'd spent all this money on optimizing their applications, optimizing uh, their file system, buying the best machines they could, and then the whole thing was being tanked by some script uh, putting, the, putting the data in the wrong place. So that's, an, that's an, an, an example of how abstraction doesn't always work. You do really need to know what's going on if you're going to get the best performance. It's far too easy to, to tank performance with uh, just one simple mistake. Um, Here's another, uh, another example. Um, the, uh, this was a, a company that we worked with. Uh, again, very short running applications. Um, and they had a bunch of different license servers listed in their environment variable, very easy to set up. Um, and the license software just goes away and finds an available license. Um, but if you look at this particular trace, um, the red lines here, I hope you can see the, uh, the connect line across the middle of the trace. The red lines are actually failed connections. So you can see here it, the application spends 200 milliseconds out of a run that lasts less than a second. It spends 200 milliseconds just hanging around waiting for failed connections before finally getting a license. That's a disaster. You've just... <coughs> thrown away more than 30% more than of your performance. So there's an example where just really something simple is reordering the license servers in the, uh, in the, the settings for, for obtaining licenses um, can very quickly give you a lot more performance. And here we have uh, another case study. This, this one's a bit different. Um, this is an example where one user couldn't type in anything into their login systems. Um, so the IT manager traced a StarTex session for that user um, and he saw that uh, XMBind, uh, the key binding uh, application, was sourcing the wrong key bindings. So here we've got a picture of that. We've got a trace of StarTex at the top. Uh, you can see XMBind being called, and you can see that it's accessing the uh, bind aliases in slash grid. Um, now, that's an application-specific area of the file system. There's no way the, the system should be getting their tool bind, key bindings from there. Um, they were overriding the, the local key bindings and <coughs> preventing the user from typing anything. So that was another example of just simply swapping the environment variables around so that the system key bindings were sourced first um, instead of these ones in slash grid. Um, so this time it was easy. It was obviously due to a lot of system level knowledge um, from the IT manager in question, but how long can we, can we do this? What if it's not a problem with your application? It's not a problem with your virtual machine. It's in fact a problem with the host operating system. If you're running your application in some third-party cloud, how on earth are you going to debug anything from there? So where do we go from here? One of the problems is um, how do we trace a distributed application? Um, I've, the examples I've looked at here have largely speaking, being applications running on Linux systems. What if you have um, a, a, a Linux processing 
system with uh, a, a Linux database. Uh, you've got some Java application which could be running on anything to it, um, to be honest. And then you've got the user app accessing this system through the internet from any device they want. How are you actually going to profile that? It's, you can potentially set up a few uh, load benchmarks um, in, your, in your own system, but once it's out in the wild, how are you going to cope with unexpected drops in performance? You can use uh, a whole variety of system-level monitoring tools in order to see which part is being hammered the most, but how are you actually going to tie that back to what the user is doing? How do you know how much of the... Um, when you've spotted a bottleneck, for example, in your database, how do you know which calls from which users actually caused that, that spike in, in performance? It's not just a question of uniform load, obviously, under, under some uh, system with a very simple API, um, you know it's just a case of lots of traffic. But that's not what real applications look like. In real applications, you can have some, some operations causing very little load on the system at the same time as some few, application, few uh, uses causing a very high level of load on the system. And so how are you actually going to create that story from the user right through the whole system accessing every part of your of your application back to what they actually experience. So uh, even if we could create um, a tool that would do lots of different tracing with lots of, I know there are, there are lots of good tools out there with open APIs that let you create and share information across different systems easily, but how do we actually marry them all together? because it's not necessarily going to be fit for Android or a Mac front-end, um, as well as a, a Java application. And the second problem is, of course, what should we measure? Um, it's hard to combine different data sets, even with open, um, open, open data and open APIs for different tracing tools and debugging tools. We're never going to align the whole community. So how do we actually pull out the bits of information we need? Um, and we certainly don't want to measure everything. So how do we work it out so that we can pull out just the bits that we want at that particular time? Obvi obviously, if we measure everything, we're just going to tank the performance of everything that we've been, uh, we've been working for. And there'll be an unacceptable delay when you click like on, uh, on, your, on your girlfriend's kitten pictures. So. Um, we don't want to reverse engineer uh, every system that we need to profile. We need to find a better solution for that. So one solution is design for profiling. We've all heard of design for test. Um, and hopefully we all design effective <coughs> testing methodologies um, whenever we go about architecting a system. We all know how to create correctness in our code, make sure that our functions can cope with, with all the possible available inputs without throwing uh, unnecessary exceptions. But what about design for profiling? Because performance bugs are still bugs. If it doesn't work at the end of the day, it's a bug. Um, so we can build programs with debug symbols and debug code, um, but often turning them on um, is, a, uh, is a measure everything scenario. And that's not always what we want. We actually usually need something highly configurable. Um, and that becomes another engineering challenge in itself. Um, it's normal to have a design team for the application and a design team for test, but maybe we need to start having a design team for observability as well. So critically, pro profiling frameworks should really be chosen at the start and not attached later on. So I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tell you what we offer. Um, these solutions are available for creating custom profilers and custom debuggers. Um, but I'm not going to pretend that this is some um, panacea for the, for the problem. 
Um, our Breeze technology is based on top of a tracing framework called StarTrace. Um, we can make custom debuggers and custom profilers using that, and we also have um, uh, just started to support an open source uh, solution for doing similar levels of uh, inspection to Java applications. So by combining the two, you do get a lot of visibility into the system, matching up, for example, calls in the application with uh, network level information and, and so on. Um, but we're still a long way from creating a framework uh, and an ecosystem that can tell us anything we want to know, when we want to know it. Um, one solution is to try and monitor everything and correlate to actually expect that a large proportion of the performance is going to be given over to measurement um, and observability. That means that we focus more on meeting deadlines rather than getting the best performance for our money. Um, it's always going to be difficult to get fine-grained coverage without harm harming performance, um, but with enough op options in there, then hopefully we can, we can gather the information that we want to see. Um, and this gives um, an opportunity, rather than to go in for pinpoint debugging approaches, i.e., is the correct number being read from that file the fifth time it is accessed, that, that level of debugging, we can go for a more holistic view of debugging where we can solve performance problems without looking at the application architecture in detail. So um, trying to work out where we get the, what kind of behavior leads to um, spikes in the network or spikes in, in memory use. And perhaps one day we could actually start to predict what our applications are doing. I know a number of the larger vendors are already looking at, at that. I, I passed a, um, a big screen on my way to the station um, to come here, which is all about Microsoft's um, efforts in uh, correlating uh, data within their cloud by measuring and trying to predict what's going on. And, and I think the, there are a number of people doing similar work in, in the Linux community. So, now it's time for your ideas. Now it's time for your questions. So, yes? Breeze, uh, LD preload, set of libraries, is this open source or are you just using this for more or less consulting work for companies where you would need to figure out what's going on? Um, so you're, you're asking about whether um, Breeze is open source. Breeze isn't an open source tool um, at the moment. We can make open source LD preload libraries for companies if they need an open source solution. Um, but of course, it won't be the, it won't be the full technology. Um, uh, so, so yeah, the, the, um, the configurability in our LD preload library, at, at the moment, it's largely been on a consultancy basis, but we've got plans to open up the API so that you don't get the source code of our um, LD preload technology, but you can use it to make LD preload libraries yourself. As in, you can uh, essentially supply a, your code to a, to a build infrastructure and then, and then make your own. So from that sense, um, we are opening it up to the community. So, yes? So, from what I gather from your talk, you seem to have looked into debuggers and compilers, but uh, We're basically doing tra uh, system call level tracing uh, in LTTNG from within the kernel. Uh, we have introspection within the applications with user level tracing. Uh, we have uh, uh, cloud, uh, cloud support, basically some synchronization of traces across an entire cluster. We have also have that synchronization of traces between user space and the kernel. So pretty much everything that you're listing here as work that should be investigated are actually things that have been solved a couple of years ago. 
So you, you might be interested to look into those solutions, mainly for, for the <coughs> racing backend. Because I think what, what's interesting here is that you bring inter interesting analysis on top of the, the, the data extraction. But a lot of work has been done already on the extraction. Yeah, so the, the question was, why on earth, why didn't I, why, why didn't I give a talk on LTTNG is, is largely your question. Um, there are a number of talks later on where you can learn about LTTNG and the marvelous work that, um, that has been done in filling this space. It is one of the tools um, that does solve a lot of the problems um, that I've been talking about today. Um, but it is, again, by no means a solution for, for everything. Um, it's a very powerful tracing tool, but it doesn't necessarily give you the same flexibility to uh, change the application. So, for example, it's very difficult to um, uh, manipulate an application and uh, change the arguments. So we can set up tracing differently on a job that's been launched remotely, depending on what the parent did. Um, we don't just monitor the whole cluster um, because we don't want to monitor the whole cluster. We can't monitor the whole cluster because we're mon monitoring applications that are running against, uh, running in systems with applications that have, uh, that can't be traced because they're, they're in production. They're in, in the middle of taping out a chip, for example. Um, so a combined approach um, would be a very good solution for a number of problems, but again, there are still problems out there uh, which it doesn't solve. Um, it would be interesting to I mean, eventually discuss about collaboration because what you described here, I mean, is partly solved by filtering, eventually can be solved by uh, adding triggers into the tracer, and this is things that we're planning for the uh, coming year. So it, it might be very interesting to get together and discuss this. Yes, yeah, it's certainly a technology that is um, working very hard to fill a number of gaps. But, but yeah, as I say, please go to the talk on LTTNG if you want to know more about that. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah. Are you happy with the early pre-built mechanism? Do you think it's the end of the line or do you think we need to come up with something else? Oh, wow, what a question. Um, there are a number um, of issues, I suppose, that my developers would uh, would come up with and say that we could do this and that to, to make life easier. But by and large, um, the, um, uh, it gives you enough rope to hang yourself, basically. So you can pretty much do what you like as long as you know what you're doing. And that's um, that from, from our point of view, that's great. But it also means that we've needed to produce the star trace libraries to allow people to pick up the technology and run with it quickly. So, um, yeah, yes and no. No, sy no system's perfect, but it's certainly, it's certainly fine for our needs. But by no means, the, the, as, it, as we've already said, the, the only technology in, in, in the game. Yep. Uh, I'm interested in more in the Java part of your work, how it's progressing. As you mentioned, you are starting to do this, if I understand properly. Yeah, so we're starting to support an existing open source technology. Um, uh, it's been developed by a research group in Switzerland and uh, at the Italian University of Switzerland. And um, again, it's a case of their system is brilliant. Um, it's very, very powerful. It gives you uh, a lot of control about what you monitor in Java applications, um, but it gives you enough rope to hang yourself, basically. So what we're doing is offering support so that people who want to develop something quickly and easily um, can ask us to help them do that. Um, but yes, it's the, the technology is fully available for anyone to download um, and take a look at. Um, if you want to look at the, the technology itself, it's called uh, Diesel, D-I-S-L, um, and we'll be adding links to the commercial support later on this year uh, on our website. So, yes. Uh, yes, there are a number of security um, um, uh, problems that can prevent it from working, and 
Um, we've circumvented most of them, and we're not going to tell you how. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, it's, it's an incredibly powerful technique because it lets you change the application. So, of course, there are security measures built into Linux to prevent you from doing that. But um, if you think hard enough, most of it's not, not, not a problem. So, one last question. No? Okay. I think... Oh, yes. Sorry. You start the opinion by showing sort of the, the gap between the construction that we're placing on and, and the system that we're It seems like every time you, you go from one level to the next, you've got a complete change of tool set in your visualization. What do you do to address this, this um, confidence as you shift from one to level to the next? So, um, the... Uh, question was about uh, visualization and the fact that when you change from instruction level tracing to system level tracing, you change your visualization and it's a very clunky transition. I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the problems. Most of the talk has been about the tracing technology, but actually visualization is just as hard a problem. Um, and uh, I know LTTNG has got some uh, very good visualization tools with, with open APIs, but um, uh, what we find is usually when it's, it's a mixture, so some data can be easily represented by, by tools that are already out there, but some data isn't, and it's just a question of having that expertise at your fingertips and just being smart about it, thinking about, this comes back to the uh, design for profiling, think about what you want to see and how you're going to see it, um, I think is the only way. So, okay, thank you very much. <laughs>